is an legal advisor to National Internet Exchange of India and the Ministry of Information Technology, Government of India. On the requisition of e-committee formed by Honorable Supreme Court of India, ma'am authored the e-filing manual for introduction of e-filing process across 21 high courts and over 10,000 district courts throughout India. Ma'am has also been on the expert panel of UNICEF on online safety and is actively associated with ICMEC, International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. She has also founded an organization that is Foundation for Institutional Reform and Education to promote cyber awareness and to empower enforcement agencies along with women and children. Ma'am was conferred the Lord Day Award from the Chief Justice of India in 2020 for her book, Artificial Intelligence Unveiled. Ma'am also received National Gaurav Puraskar in 2017 for her exemplary contributions to cyber law. In 2015, Ma'am received Digital Empowerment Award and the Lord Day Award from the Chief Justice of India for her book on protection of children on the internet. Ma'am, it's not only a pleasure to have you here with us today, it's also an honor. Before I pass the charge of today's meeting to Dr. Kanika, ma'am, I'd like to inform the attendees that if they have any questions, they should feel free to leave them in the chat box section or the live chat section, depending on where they are joining us. Without further ado, I now request Dr. Kanika Set, ma'am, to please take charge of this meeting. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Mihir. It's indeed a matter of uh, great pleasure for me to be here today to discuss this very pertinent uh, subject of electronic evidence and I thank uh, each one of uh, the honorable uh, judges and all the um, you know delegates today to to actually attend this uh, session which is on electronic evidence and whether as a law, law practitioner or otherwise this this area of law is growing and with the kind of dynamics of uh, cyber law uh, this is something which is uh, very much at the helm of uh, debates and discussions and evolution in terms of law at this point of time. So I, I thank uh, the MP Law College Aurangabad, uh, the District Legal Services Authority and the Advanced Center for Research and Development uh, in Cyber Laws, NLSIU, for uh, organizing this lecture on this, such an important theme. Now, I do, uh, I think I would begin by sharing a presentation uh, with you all. Uh, this is, um, uh, would you be sharing the presentation from your end? Uh, yes, madam. Yes, kindly share it. Yes, ma'am. And uh, you can also sh share the control with me so that I can uh, change the yes. slide. Yes, madam, is it visible to you? Um, I would like to share my screen if it's not there right now from your end. Um, you can share. You can share. No? I can share. Very well. Yes, uh, yes. I will just do the same. Uh, is it showing now? Yes, yes, madam. Yes, you can see yes, the screen? Yes. Very well. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so uh, we begin by uh, discussing today the electronic evidence that is by, with an overview of the IT Act. I would like to discuss how uh, the IT Act framework is at the moment and how the different uh, you know, chapters are there and the kind of offenses, the cyber crimes in particular, and the kinds of trends which are happening today because these are the kind of cases which are coming to the courts and uh, require appreciation of electronic evidence. So when we had the IT Act uh, enacted, it was 20 years ago. Uh, almost as, as much as time as I've been in practice and I've seen it grow with time. 
the changes that have been uh, the salient features uh, you know of the act were initially only uh, the preamble as as we call it it was only to you know make e filing as one of the modes or recognize uh, legally the you know admissibility of uh, electronic documents and uh, you know so make certain amendments in the acts which are relevant to electronic media that was the preamble initially but uh, with time uh, if we see the uh, the the breadth of the or the spectrum of the act the ambit has increased and the scope has increased many folds um, the basic structure if we see the of the it act uh, starts with obviously the jurisdiction part where is the jurisdiction and we will be discussing a bit on that when it comes to civil and criminal cases how the jurisdiction is assessed and uh, the kinds of offenses that is dealt with under a separate chapter which is chapter 11 and chapter 9 deals with civil contraventions now in civil contraventions uh, the mens rea as we call it you know mental intention to commit a crime is not there however it is still a civil wrong like a tort law so that is uh, dealt with under a separate chapter these key themes are very important because in any cyber crime case that we've dealt with Firstly, we try and see what are the ingredients and whether it falls in which chapter, whether it is a contravention or it's an uh, offense. And obviously, the jurisdiction is important parameter when we appreciate before even we appreciate electronic evidence involved in the case. And therefore, I thought it will be helpful if we just go through, uh, you know, the overview of the same as well, while we are discussing this uh, electronic evidence in detail today. So um, as we see in this slide, the IT Act was enacted uh, on 17th May 2000. And uh, India is probably the 12th nation in the world to adopt this cyber law. The main special legislation of IT Act, uh, sometimes we have to you know, apply other acts in, in conjunction with the same because it depends on the offense. If it's a criminal law, I mean, we use IPC, Criminal Procedure Code, Indian Evidence Act, and also if it is a children related crime, then POXO Act sometimes gets involved. If it's specifically to do with say pornography or any kind of uh, you know, sexual harassment to a child, or if it is an IP, IP matter, which is an intellectual property matter, maybe depends uh, whether it's a trademark or a copyright, like a data theft case, we use Copyright Act many times. And uh, so depending on the uh, exact uh, you know, constituents of that offense, uh, or, or if it's a civil matter, these various uh, special laws could also run in tandem or a general law also could apply alongside the IT Act. That's how uh, the statutes we try and see depending on the offense involved. Now, as I was ex uh, just explaining that uh, the incitral model law is the key, uh, you know, uh, model law of e-commerce that is, uh, you know, the key foundation of how we have tried to uh, incorporate those principles also in the IT Act. Because uh, the model law of e-commerce also grants the legal recognition to electronically signed documents that at par with the hard copy uh, signed documents like we do in pen and paper. Now, with this, uh, you know, these kind of principles are also enshrined in that same law, and therefore we have also, you know, taken the same in the Indian IT Act. And uh, this is a global phenomenon. Most of the legislations across the world incorporate these key principles, without which we will not be able to handle any kind of electronic record if, or an agreement, for instance, if it is not legally recognized. Uh, you know, if it's formed online, where the offer acceptance and uh, consideration is paid online, uh, the legally recognized agreement is also formed in such a case. So these are some very key principles which operate in the IT uh, field as well. Now, if we see the uh, prescriptive jurisdiction of the IT Act, I must say that whether a person is based abroad, if he commits a crime in India, for example, he hacks into a system or a computer within the confines of, you know, India, Indian boundaries, will also commit a, a crime if he hacks into a system here. The IT Act itself has a huge prescriptive jurisdiction. The challenge is there that how do we enforce the law? 
because unless we have a treaty unless we have a cooperation arrangement with that country it becomes a very difficult task to get extradition to get electronic evidence from abroad brought into india and the it act uh, basically says they if the offense is committed uh, and if there's a contravention from outside india by any person irrespective of his nationality whether he is a foreign national anywhere then uh, if such act involves a computer or a computer system or a network located in india there then the cyber crime uh, it occurs within the it act itself you know the, so the person who is a perpetrator can actually be uh, put uh, you know uh, into uh, an investigation and a trial can happen as per the it act provided we are able to get the extradition here of this person now power to investigate and is of the in inspector and above rank in, in india and therefore earlier used to be dsp and above but now inspector and above is the rank in india which who can investigate the offenses now when we talk about the overview of it act the chapter 1 talks about preliminary uh, the extent of applicability which i just explained then chapter 2 talks about digital signatures now digital signatures and electronic signatures are recognized as valid legally in india specifically digital signatures which are based on the public key encryption uh, you know cryptography as we call it it is based on a mathematical algorithm where a hash function is generated with the hash function generated it's uh, easy for uh, you know uh, Uh, want to use it with a token and uh, there is a cryptographic algorithm which runs and uh, the person who has sent this will use his private key to generate it and the person to whom it is sent the recipient will actually use the public key to encrypt decrypt it so that what happens with the use of digital signatures we are commonly using it even for making income tax filings or otherwise today the whole phenomena is such that the message which is transferred is not tampered with and the orig uh, origin of the message can be uh, ascertained with uh, legal certainty that is the huge uh, the huge uh, role that digital signatures play in today's domain when a lot of contracts are happening online and the transactions happen online digital signatures proves a very very helpful tool in this regard now then chapter 3 talks about electronic governance and use of uh, the legal recognition of electronic records and uh, then chapter 4 discusses the attribution acknowledgement dispatch of electronic records so the time of uh, receipt of the same if, if there's an email which is sent to a person who which is sent on a designated email id where somebody has designated that this is the mail id i will need to receive on then uh, the acknowledgement the, the time of receipt is the time when it reaches the server of this person's email box and in the case he has sent it to another email id which is not registered or designated in that res respect the receipt will occur that at the point of time when he actually reads the message not when the time when it reaches the server these are the kind of um, attribution acknowledgement dispatch uh, you know rules which have been created under the it act then chapter 4 talk 5 talks about secure electronic records and signatures chapter 6 talks about the certifying authorities the whole uh, controller is at the top of the pyramid you can see he is the main controller of certifying uh, authorities who are actually giving these are entities who are actually giving digital signature certificates to finally end consumer who are subscribers so that is how the hierarchy is controller certifying authorities and then end end uh, user that is in this case then uh, the duties of subscriber supposedly there is a uh, you know uh, uh, in case uh, of digital signatures that they have to be kept like a checkbook is kept very safe similarly the the signatures the tokens have to be kept very safe and the, that is the obligation of the uh, subscriber that is what is highlighted also in this chapter 8 and chapter 9 talks about the compensation now by way of example just to explain it very clearly if uh, if there is an employee supposingly who goes to uh, who's been asked to come to office and work on a system on on a holiday and uh, he feels that you know he wants to carry a pen drive with him to work now he works on that and he listens to music by putting that pen drive 
if supposingly the system gets corrupted and the data gets erased out of it because of a virus which was contained in it but he was innocent he did not know that this, this pen drive contained a virus yet he does cause loss to the you know uh, employer in that regard he can be sued for compensation for asking or co for compensation under chapter 9 which is section 43 of the it act now, if there was this was coupled with mensria, he really wanted to spoil the data of the employer. He really wanted that there should be some sort of a uh, you know a data which should be corrupted. Then he would be obviously charged you know after three years with mensria, commit an offence. If an offence is committed, then uh, you know what what happens uh, in in the case of uh, an offence, you just need to uh, you know in that in that regard the offense is committed and then the section 66 will come into play which is the chapter uh, 11 of the it act then uh, we talk about you know the kind of offenses which are there we will be coming to those but uh, by and large there are a lot of uh, you know uh, different uh, sections under the it act for example you have uh, the 66 f which talks about terrorism cyber terrorism section 66 e talks about invasion of privacy like creation of any kind of mmss or other uh, videos which go viral that could be there and then uh, there would there were other kinds of you know issues which can be uh, there for example identity theft 66 c talks about that cheating by personation 66 d talks about that and uh, if we see 66 a which was earlier there in case of any kind of you know messages sent abroad like uh, to anybody rather sent to anybody to harass somebody now in that scenario the 66a was applicable earlier and there was a three year term of punishment you know, imprisonment and fine or more however with the shreya single case the supreme court of india was seized of this issue and the challenge was on account of the ambiguous words used in the section 66a and it got uh, struck down. Constitutionally, it was held to be invalid because it was very, very ambiguous in terms of interpretation and therefore uh, that was struck down. However, we have other provisions of the IPC. For example, a lot of in women related you know, trolling cases or other uh, harassment cases use 509-354-A, B, C, D are there which provide for you know, offenses pertaining to uh, stalking uh, offenses pertaining to uh, any kind of video barbarism or creation of any uh, videos to harass a woman or uh, invasion of privacy. So those kind of issues are, you know, basically there under that uh, law. Now, with these kind of, you know, if you see the kind of offenses, by and large, the sending of, for example, obscene uh, messages is, is again an offense. Now, section 67 and 67A talks about that. Sexually explicit messages, 67A. And a lot of these cases, specifically uh, women uh, harassment cases have arisen in the past uh, few months or I would say years in India. And 7.3% is the latest uh, NCRB statistics that uh, have seen uh, of 2019 which have been uh, you know uh, basically reported by the ncrb and every year the cyber crime has actually doubled so earlier uh, there were about 24000 cases reported in uh, 2018 and in year 2019 they went up to 45000 cases so that's a huge number but i would still say it's not reflecting the true uh, you know uh, the true figures because there is less reporting in india there is less reporting at this point of time. So coming to uh, the offenses, I do want to highlight that a lot of these offenses are up to giving a punishment up to three years of uh, imprisonment, fine or more. And uh, a lot of them happen to be, uh, you know, bailable, uh, cognizable, but bailable. But beyond uh, three years, like if it's five years or more, it is an unbailable offense. Then we have chapter, uh, you know, further chapters 11, 12, 13, there 12, you have basically intermediary liability. So social media, for example, you have so many social media portals today, are they accountable? Now, as per there, the, the law there is that uh, if they have got an actual notice that this uh, illegal content is on their site, then they have to take it down. 
and that they are liable if they don't act on it. That's how uh, the basic uh, provision there is. And sec that is under section 79 of the IT Act. And then there are miscellaneous provisions. So um, I think uh, with this, uh, if we see the next slide, this brings me to uh, briefly to discuss uh, jurisdiction in online cases, basically. Uh, the earlier approach was that wherever a system is being uh, you know, controlled, uh, can be accessed. For example, I'm sitting here and I can view a site in Bangalore or otherwise, otherwise anywhere. That will itself uh, invoke jurisdiction, but that would not be a right approach today with uh, KCO India company case. And then later on new cases, which have come, the, the Banyan tree case uh, is holding good at the ground at this point of time. In lo the long and short of it is that if it is an interactive site, which is, for example, somebody is placing orders or, you know, to send goods to a particular location, say in Delhi, and the site is in Bangalore, and they are interactive uh, site, not a static site, and they are targeting Delhi-based customers. So even in that case, even Delhi would have jurisdiction. So that is how we see whether they are targeting the customers. It's known as the Zippo sliding scale approach. It is also known as the targeting effects test or the targeting test. That's how we uh, call it. And that's how we determine jurisdiction, mm -hmm. whether they are targeting the customers in that area or not. Then in uh, copyright infringement and other cases, if we see uh, the super cassette industries has been a very in interesting case where uh, the courts normally look at whether uh, there was a copyright infringement by a particular platform like MySpace in this case, where certain movies and certain clips were put now, if that is there, um, then is it causing a copyright infringement? The owner of the copyright can hold MySpace uh, accountable in, in a scenario where they are able to monitor the content and they are actually authorizing putting up such content, infringing content. So that was uh, also examined. The target approach was used in this case. And uh, it was basically decided the issue was that suit can be filed where can it be filed also that was also another uh, issue which was there Absolutely. and the copyright infringement uh, was mm. also important in this regard mm. so there the suit it was held that it can be filed where the plaintiff carries on the work under section 62 of the copyright act apart from the grounds of section 20 of the cpc so part of cause of action or uh, where the defendant resides all those are also available uh, but uh, again, uh, the person whose copyright has been infringed can also sue from his own jurisdiction uh, you know, area. So that was also uh, looked into in this case. Similarly, I want to highlight that if a, supposedly a case comes to a court of law, that we are only a virtual office. In this case, this was a case, Worldwide uh, Wrestling Foundation versus Reshma Collection, where uh, again, a copyright infringement case uh, and trademark infringement case where the office was not physically located in a jurisdiction in Delhi. It was not physically located. However, a Bombay based defendant was uh, uh, alleged to have, uh, you know, uh, infringed the trademarks and copyrights of Worldwide Wrestling Foundation. And in such a case, the court held that if they had customers in Delhi, then uh, this, this company, WWF, even if they don't have a physical office here, yet they can sue the defendant. You know, that is possible. And therefore, jurisdiction was held to be maintainable. If the customers are there in Delhi, that is uh, enough, they said. So that's, again, using the Banyan tree uh, approach that, uh, that was used in this case. Now, these are important because all virtual courts are now, uh, you know, sorry, the virtual, uh, you know, cases are all happening. Uh, today's times that jurisdiction becomes a key issue to be decided even before the other issues become, uh, you know, important. In terms of uh, criminal remedies, uh, yes, uh, Copyright Act, we have Section 63. So uh, those were invoked and a civil remedy in such cases uh, under you know, 55 of the Copyright Act. So again, injunction damages and account for profits was there. And uh, likewise, uh, there have been many other cases, but I will not uh, delve too much into it because we have to stress more on electronic evidence for the time being. I just want to mention blocking of web pages is another uh, remedy 
which is always uh, you know a sort in some, some, a lot of these cases where takedowns are required so in many defamation cases the courts have looked into uh, you know uh, the effect where the effect of defamation is occurring also has uh, jurisdiction can be invoked there apart from where it is committed from because in the cyber space sometimes you will not know from where a particular uh, you know a defamatory post has been put up so in that regard even the place where the effect of defam defamation is felt is the right jurisdiction to move here in cpc uh, sorry crpc we have many uh, sections but the one of the most important sections we've used uh, here is where 178 the act where it is done and the consequence of any uh, where this is felt so in defamation matters specifically we have used these uh, in the crpc to actually invoke jurisdiction in a particular police station or a particular jurisdiction in a area now this slide is basically showing what is section 43 and in section 43 when we talk about civil contraventions we are uh, looking at you know acts which have caused any downloading unauthorized downloading any introduction of a virus any disruption of a system uh, damage to any data and such other uh, you know ingredients and there the main remedy lies in compensation who is the authority who is the uh, competent uh, authority in this case is the adjudicating authority and they, that uh, post is basically at this point of time secretary it of every state who has the uh, competence or the power to actually decide these cases of de uh, de these uh, contraventions at this point of time and if there is an appeal to be made it goes to the uh, the uh, td sat court which is uh, the telecom and dispute regulation uh, service authority which is here uh, the td sat in uh, delhi and then we have high court and after high court it goes to supreme court so this is how the hierarchy uh, of courts is and then when we look at the compensation quantum it is decided based on uh, the repetition of such uh, conduct or the particular act how much loss it is caused to a particular party and the kind of information which is taken away so a lot of these factors are looked into for giving the compensation section 43 a is very very important particularly from the point of view of pdp bill which is personal data you know protection because a lot of sensitive data of people is being taken away by websites which are phishing websites and they steal passwords they steal financial information of people and they cause them losses now in this regard uh, 43 a gives an obligation on the service providers who are collecting this data to maintain reasonable security practices to protect this information and usually um, iso 27001 is a kind of held to be a good certification to have and that suffices if uh, the, that is there then um, that will comply with this provision uh, of security now the indian pdp bill i want to mention here uh, takes away the term passwords from the definition of sensitive personal data but includes many new new kinds of categories like uh, a person's health data a person's sexual orientation a person's biometrical data genetic data uh, religious political views and beliefs so at this moment these uh, may not be uh, entirely covered but this new pdp bill It does have these provisions, and we are hoping that it will create a stronger and robust mechanism to protect people's data in the country. Also, a good point is that the government entities are going to be equally liable uh, and responsible as private entities in when this act comes into play, and it has a huge deterrent punishment. Uh, Euros twenty million, uh, like GDPR. Uh, so up to 15 crores in indian rupees and uh, up to 4% global turnover that is the kind of penalty which is given under the act uh, this particular bill as, as well so now i did mention the isp liability but i want to just uh, highlight that they are in in they are responsible for maintaining due diligence all isps what i mean by isps the term is now changed with intermediaries intermediaries are liable for removing any content which is illegal if they are informed within 36 hours if they don't then they are liable 
they can be given uh, you know asked to give pay compensation and other uh, liabilities also can be invoked this brings me to uh, explaining exactly what is cyber crime because uh, when i when we deal with the law enforcement authorities when we talk to them uh, the several of these uh, crimes are percolating today in the cyber space all those things which were earlier uh, offline like blackmail for instance forgery embezzlement all is happening online through um, various means and softwares and techniques now in this uh, you know present times what are the kinds of categories this can be you know put into one is crimes against government one is crimes against property and the other is crimes against persons obviously uh, in the times of artificial intelligence that we are today cyber terrorism uh, damage to critical infrastructure of the country is becoming a huge concern cyber warfare uh, then hacking sabotage credit card frauds these are uh, percolating then uh, phishing attacks the phishing is the phishing which is financial crime A creation of for example a fake website which is uh looking like the original website which asks you for any information of yours and you give those financial details for example net banking and then that is used to money, uh, siphon off the monies you know by the criminal so those are known as phishing then similarly there this phishing is used by man in the middle attacks a person who hacks into the system creates a confusion in a buyer and a seller and asks them to send monies to another third account in another country again a very rampant offense then ransomware ransomware is uh, again uh, you know there's a virus or infection which is uh, sent through maybe an email and that infects the system in such a manner that it it encrypts the entire data in the system if that happens again that's a problem and to decrypt it they ask for money so it's like extortion so those are the kind of things which are happening and there are hybrid versions of phishing if it is through voip like maybe using voice over internet protocol like skype or any other uh, you know uh, media then it is called wishing and if it is by sms it is known as smishing so there are various hybrids of these crimes also today apart from ip frauds which are stealing of source code stealing of any copyrighted database um, defamation cyber stalking trolling uh, sex extortion Uh, revenge porn and so on and so forth so there there are n number of these uh, crimes today and threats uh, which are targeting people at large and some of them targeting more women and children as well in times of covid where when we are uh, you know there's a time of home schooling at this point a lot of children specifically are becoming targets of uh, you know phishing and uh, in the games that they are playing Uh, a lot of uh, issues regarding identity theft and even credit card frauds so that is another uh, issue which is emerging and uh, definitely uh, the use of these uh, softwares and other tools to hack into systems of people is quite common so that is being you know dealt with under various offenses under the it act if you see this screen 66 talks about computer related offenses then identity theft terrorism uh, cheating by personation uh, 66c is to preserve the data that is an obligation of the intermediary uh, stealing uh, and keeping a computer resource like a stolen mobile phone with somebody who knows this is stolen again an offense so violation of privacy and so on and so forth there are so many of these yet i feel there are a lot of them which are still not there in this it act a one glaring example is how to combat fake news there is no provision today to talk tackle the fake news as a express provision likewise there are no express provisions after 66a was struck down in terms of uh, you know banning or prohibiting any kind of offensive messages so with this uh, there are a lot of lacunas still in the law and uh, we are in the process of you know getting new laws like data protection for instance is being formalized then various sections of ipc uh, also are used alongside uh, you know when we talk about uh, any kind of these offenses are mentioned a lot of these uh, are coupled with criminal intimidation or other you know uh, offenses depending on the exact uh, offense involved and in usually in these cases uh, once this is reported 
the criminal remedies uh, are there and the electronic evidence now becomes important because uh, this is taken the electronic evidence is taken and then filed along with the complaint uh, in terms of civil remedies we file it along with the suit for example for example for injunction we have to file the same now what can be that electronic evidence it brings me to this juncture at this point we think whether an email will be an electronic evidence whether uh, will uh, the you know whatsapp chats or other chats can, can form uh, part of uh, electronic evidence uh, anything which is in the uh, books of accounts maintained regularly can that be uh, brought in as electronic evidence or uh, the phone cdr reports yes uh, all of them are electronic evidence so we will be discussing that now after all uh, any kind of printout from the system which is uh, you know or phone for that matter of fact amounts to electronic evidence how we have to preserve it how we have to produce it is a challenge and that's what we will be now discussing so uh, i will straight away go to uh, this uh, you know slide which uh, talks about the uh, important aspects of electronic evidence one of the important cases here is the sayed asufuddin case now in this case you know the source code theft was involved and a phone uh, you know which was tampered with uh, to make it compatible with other phone lines so that was a source code theft case and there the tampering of the source code was in question and the the how this was done or uh, you know by a particular competitor was brought in question and this is a source code theft case where it was held that yes the the source code was uh, you know tampered with and uh, in many of these cases of hacking we have to use the emails to produce you know emails which were uh, maybe for example an employee for example takes away information from his official email id of an employer which has which has been assigned to him at the employer's place and he takes it and forwards it to his personal email id from where he maybe sets up a parallel company i've done with there with lot of these cases where a parallelly uh, you know a company has been created by an employee for example and that evidence becomes crucial to show you know later when the employer sues this employee that evidence becomes very crucial to show that yes there was siphoning away uh, you know of this data and uh, there was data theft so electronic evidence in that regard is very crucial for those kind of cases madam there is a uh, sorry to interrupt there is a request to you please kindly enlarge the screen uh, the previous slide show. slide show uh, okay there is a request request from the parties uh, surely surely thank you ma'am thank you okay so uh, in in this um, uh, in the cases which we have seen uh, you know uh, a lot of these cases of cyber crime for example in the bazi.com case uh, what was seen was the kind of uh, you know filters which were used by the auction site were there enough filters or not you know enough filters so at that point of time the footprint also is important uh, to see Uh, from where a particular uh, mms was you know uploaded this was the delhi uh, mms case where uh, you know uh, an mms was uploaded and the uh, intermediary which is the bazi.com portal was held liable and the director of the scene was arrested for the scene and it, what was seen was whether uh, they had enough filters in place and did they take any uh, measures to you know check such content from being published on their site and a lot of these times the ip the ip is what is uh, the exact location from where a particular uh, you know upload has happened uh, or takes place is important likewise in the parliament attack case also if i recall um, the forged emblems were used uh, you know on the car which were, which went inside the parliament uh, and that forged uh, emblems how were they created Uh, a phone number was retrieved the cdr of the same was revealed so all these are instances in how uh, the electronic footprint can be used whether it is an ip address or it is uh, an email which is sent or it, is it a time stamp or is it a, a particular system from which a uh, you know a server from which this is hacked like in one of the cases uh, the ip theft cases uh, the time 
of hacking and the footprint of hacking was important in a third platform called Jira. So there we used that. So depending on the case, these various forms of electronic evidence may prove useful. Uh, I would want to say that uh, in the in the case of um, you know for example uh, Suhas Kati case was the first case of criminal conviction where the accused was committed uh, you know of charges uh, and there 60, 67 of the IT Act was involved. Those videos were used. Those videos which uh, which uh, a CCTV rather you know footages and videos were used where. Uh, a lot of evidence was found, incriminating evidence against the uh, the doctor who was, uh, you know, in, in, in the Suha's uh, Kati case, it was the, the obscene images and the messages uh, about a divorced woman put on the Yahoo message group. And in the Dr. Prakash case, L. Prakash case, there the videos uh, were, you know, uh, used as evidence. So a lot of these cases involve, uh, you know, evidence in terms of electronic media. And when court looks at the test of obscenity, they look at the, uh, currently they look at the reasonable responsible leader test. That is what has been followed. Uh, it's a divergence from the earlier Miller test. And now they see whether in the eyes of a responsible reader is this obscene or not. I've already dealt with Shreya Singhal, so I'll straight away go to certain uh, you know important best practices before we move on. Uh, in terms of Wi-Fi, you know, when we talk about Wi-Fi footprint, what is the Wi-Fi which is being used in a particular case? Uh, you know, the secure platforms need to be used. Bluetooth uh, needs to be turned off. In many cases, we find uh, evidence through use of Wi-Fi. Uh, and many times we find evidence through any kind of software used to hide one's real identity also, like hide IP or other software, where a person is deliberately using it to hide his identity. That uh, IP is also important. And things like Tor, it's very common everyday scenario, people are using Tor. And then uh, softwares, what software was there? What OS is there? Uh, what machine was used? But in, in security practices, people are using antiviruses, anti-spywares. Uh, the viruses are quarantined. What virus was there? For example, in a ransomware attack, that becomes very important. And many times, uh, people don't uh, obviously uh, you know, read the terms and conditions, and uh, they just download data or they may not use digital signatures, two-factor authentication, whether it was used or not. And where was a payment made? HTTPS site, secure socket, layer protected site, or was it not bearing a lock, like, you know, which shows it is a protected site. All those aspects become very important, both in terms of security, as well as in terms of uh, electronic evidence. Now, this brings me to uh, the main part of our presentation, Earlier, I've given you a background of what, what was you know, there in terms of uh, law, I would say, uh, when it comes to IT Act, cyber crime, what are the trends, uh, what are the offenses, when is it not an offense, it's a contravention, uh, what kind of cases like, you know, have been Basi.com and other uh, important cases like El Prakash. Now, with this background, I really want to explain what is electronic evidence because we understand whatever is uh, in pen and paper or whatever is in ink or you know in a hard copy is evidence which you can bring but in today's world and today's times when everything from work to communication is happening online electronic evidence is far far more important than anything else and section 3 of our evidence act has been amended basically to say that the admissibility of electronic records as evidence and our IT Act itself says that yes, all um, you know, like handwritten signatures, electronically signed documents are valid. And if they are secure electronic records, means digitally signed, then the presumption arises that these are correct and these are valid and these are authentic. And with that, with that, I will just like to also mention that all electronically made contracts where payments have also maybe occurred online are valid under section 10A of our IT Act. Section four gives confers the legal recognition to electronic records. And then 
it also you know section uh, 79a of the amendment act also defined those uh, electronic evidence which includes our computers uh, evidence digital evidence audio evidence or cctv footage your uh, cdr data cell phones digital fax machines printers and even uh, i would say a lot of cloud based material because a lot of times we using cloud data so any files which have been saved on the cloud it can also be forming part of the evidence a challenge now for our courts is and for our judicial officers and our uh, judges is here that how do we you know take evidence how is to is supposed to be filed and where is it supposed to be kept in the court if we start keeping all the mobile devices in the court as filings where it will require a huge amount of time space and resources for the you know court and the registry to take charge of it and then the issues of preservation the issues of maintaining those softwares the issues of how do we verify this is the correct one is this original this is not original becomes a challenge so at this point in time i'm very pleased to say that uh, you know we are in charge and we are looking into uh, this uh, new formation of new rules of electronic evidence how it has to be brought in the court of law how it can be filed and where it will be saved and what sort of a hash mechanism will be used to verify it we are actually in the midst of forming it and i'm happy to be a part of that uh, exercise as well so uh, here i want to now importantly you know in mention here what is after all primary and secondary evidence if i were to uh, put this mobile phone you know in in say file this in the court of law this obviously is a primary evidence and if i have to file an email for instance in the court of law it will become a secondary evidence now when we have to prove the same with documentary evidence we understand that this has to uh, you know be proven either we prove give it give the original uh, or we we give the uh, secondary evidence so in secondary evidence specifically for electronic records there is a section where 65 a and b of the the evidence act becomes important now what happens in this after all the servers uh, you know are mo not movable the systems may may not be movable and they may be very bulky the whole network so you take a print out from there the relevant print out is produced along with a certificate uh, which is given by the chief technology officer of the company or the owner of the particular uh, device and that needs to say that this is been taken from the uh, particular device or computer giving those specifications and the time when it was printed uh, it was running in proper order it was not malfunctioning the the content which is reproduced is uh, the one which was maintained in the daily course of business and um, it is uh, you know uh, evident from that uh, basically that the person who is giving this has to be in charge of the system or uh, be responsible for the maintenance of the system so these are important uh, parameters which are mentioned in the section 65b particularly 4 of the uh, this particular act and with this uh, there has been a huge uh, debate over whether this is mandatory or not mandatory in india and this is something which has been at the helm of discussions and lately we have had a lot of interesting cases on it but earlier the view was in the state of ncti napjot singh's case that uh, this uh, there is no bar to adducing secondary evidence even for electronic records as per section 63 and 65 now with the new uh, you know cases which have come about even uh, the pandit rao judgment or the uh, anwar versus bashir judgment which was there earlier the 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 whole settled law is that this certificate is important this uh, declaration is important and uh, the certificate is mandatory it cannot be done away with that is what uh, the current law is but in the earlier situation the earlier cases of uh, navjot singh case it was not uh, held to be uh, you know full proof thing that you have to have the certificate there were other means allowed for proving the same in terms of admissibility i'm talking about admissibility at this point whether this is taken in evidence or not as admissible is the question we are talking about what is the weightage to be given to that evidence is a second next step indeed which if challenged can be proven through expert witnesses or otherwise 
uh, or through forensic reports of this uh, data produced. But talking about admissibility, in Anwar versus Bashir judgment, it was said that this section 65B4 uh, requires the production of this certificate by the, certif the chief technology officer and that is mandatory. That was held to be the case. And uh, later in the Shafi Muhammad's case, there was a divergence. And there it said, that, for example, a party is not uh, in possession of a device. How can it produce that certificate? So uh, he should not be uh, asked to produce a certificate, specifically if he's uh, not in possession of that device, or for example, if it's a, saved on a cloud or saved on some, uh, some other person's device or a system, and he refuses to give the data the, or the, sorry, the certificate, then what is to be done in that scenario? So that was a divergence uh, which was seen, but in the latest, uh, you know, uh, full, uh, I would say three judge bench, uh, you know, case, the Arjun Pandit Rao case, the difference is uh, now the settled law is that the conflicting interpretations have been rested. Now, what the, the Honorable Court has said in this case is that the, uh, the earlier case of Shafi Muhammad, it's, it's now, uh, diverging from that and the settled law here is that the 65b certificate is required and only if the person has tried enough and there have been all measures taken and the other person from where this certificate has to be obtained refuses to give or the entire possibilities have been uh, kind of used and uh, in vain and there is no possibility of getting that certificate can this be you know uh, like i would say uh, uh, say uh, disallowed or uh, can this be uh, you know waived this requirement but otherwise it is a mandatory requirement which you cannot do away with it's something that uh, the Arjun Pandit Rao case has said uh, also uh, it, it is also possible to keep the original device itself that is uh, something which uh, you know is permissible that will be a primary evidence but if a secondary evidence has to be produced, then this certificate is necessary. And that is what has been held in the Arjun Pandit Rao case. Now, earlier also, we have seen a lot of the admissibility challenges, not just from the point of view of 65B, but what are the kinds of electronic evidence which can be produced in a court of law? Like in the Dharamvi's case, intercepted phone conversations were used, copied from a hard disk and produced as evidence. Then. All forms of electronic evidence uh, are generally admissible if they comply with 65 A and B of the uh, Evidence Act. And what, what should be the date after all, when, when, when what this certificate needs to bear? The date when this was, uh, you know, created, the certificate was created uh, is the date when, uh, you know, th that needs to be mentioned or when the CD was made in this case of Ankur Chavla. Then there have been many other interesting, uh, you know, cases where uh, when when uh, does the 65B have to be produced by the person? If, if supposedly uh, a person uh, mistakenly doesn't file it, then in that scenario, it has been said that uh, you can, uh, you know, allow uh, filing of the same later. And uh, in the Sonu case, you know, again, there have been divergence uh, here. Uh, and it has been allowed in such cases where, uh, you know, uh, at the time of taking of the evidence, it can be filed. And if supposedly uh, there's a mistake by a particular person, it can be cured later. But by and large in civil cases at the time of producing, uh, taking of the evidence and at the time of uh, criminal ca cases, at the time of charge sheet, uh, these, these have to be produced, 65B certificates need to be given. And if not given, then at the time before the trial begins is the time that it should be in order, in placed in order. Otherwise, it will be refused admissibility, you know, in such scenarios. Now, let us just briefly look at position in UK and US as well. In UK earlier, the presumption was uh, that, you know, if, if there is um, uh, a business record exception as we call it also in the US, US but in, in the UK scenario if it's an electronic evidence which is printed and filed the presumption is it is correct now the law has changed earlier position was that it required a certificate to be given but now with the new law there, there has been changes and um, the section 69 uh, of the police criminal evidence act is now repealed 
uh, by uh, the new law, which says that it is presumed that this will be correct unless uh, you know there is a challenge to the same. So there is no requirement of 65B certificate uh, sort of a you know requirement in the U UK law anymore now. But in the US, we have the business records exception. And here, um, the requirement is there of the certificate, similar to India. So that's what we see uh, in the US and UK. And coming, to the, coming back to the Indian scenario, I just want to mention that various you know, tape recorded speeches, for example, have been held to be admissible evidence as well. So if there is a phone recording or a tape recording, and then there have been various principles. Uh, for example, the accuracy of the, the record has to be looked into. The voice of the person should be the same uh, as uh, of the maker of the record, you know. So whether this voice is tallying or not, just like your handwriting experts say and vouch for the correctness of the same, the voice has to be also identified. Those kind of parameters are there for various different, uh, you know, electronic evidences. Now, when it comes to uh, a particular CDR data, obviously the phone company will be uh, giving a certificate in this regard. And if it is uh, a system, uh, you know, a particular person system and printout is from there, he will give this particular uh, 65B evidence uh, requirement of the affidavit will be fulfilled by him. Now, this brings me to other cases on electronic evidence. Now, if we see, um, Speeches, you know, speeches, tape records, they were held to be documents under the Tukaram case. And they have been uh, CDs given, pen drives given. Uh, they have also been intercepted telephone conversations given in cases. Recording of uh, evidence through video conferencing has been held to be valid. And that is a famous Praful Desai case. And similarly, phone calls, evidences of the same. Uh, if there is an ATM, for example, in one of the cases, uh, ATM has also uh, the printouts of the ATM, uh, you know, functioning have been held to be electronic evidence. Likewise, CCTVs and other uh, electronic evidence are permissible uh, and admissible if complying with the 65B requirement. Now, if we talk about uh, the hard drives, hard drives uh, generally on the original hard drive, the analysis is not done. And usually a mirror image of that is created. And in forensics, when we use this particular electronic evidence, we mirror image that hard drive and then do the analysis. And the forensic expert will do it and uh, give the certificate under 65B that this is being done. Then many times uh, this may need to be cross-examined. The, the witnesses can be brought in. And uh, if we see section 311 of the CRPC, we see section 91 of the CRPC, production of uh, the records can be made. Section 165 of the Evidence Act also allows any witnesses to be brought in and questioned. And uh, likewise, on order 26 uh, of our CPC, we have provisions where the production of documents or um, the witnesses can be summoned for you know, giving and deposing a particular you know, uh, information or, on the uh, content or the other uh, issues relating to the electronic evidence, which has to be proven. And many times the private lab reports are challenged. So government lab reports are also there. And then in that scenario, the, uh, the opinion of the examiner of electronic evidence becomes very crucial. And that is given under our section 79A. So here uh, the examiner of electronic evidence gives the final say whether this is correct evidence or not. And depending on that, the weightage is given you know, uh, for that particular evidence. This slide basically is a snapshot of how the different kinds of evidences are there. And uh, given this uh, you know, paradigm, there's a lot of other issues apart from 65A and B, uh, which are electronic evidence. For example, you look at Section 88A of the Evidence Act, the court can treat electronic messages received as if they were sent by the originator with the exception that a presumption is not made as regards to the person by whom such message was sent. So the presumption is not that X person has only sent it unless it is a digitally signal, you know, signed message, I would say. And uh, the presumption is for an email, just a general email, which has gone that 
the it has been sent from a particular email id but not whether the same person has sent it because it can also be misused you know so that is how the law treats it then presumption in law also in section 85b of the indian evidence act there the law presumes that in case it is involving a digital signature you know and any, any particular transaction or a email then unless the contrary is proved the the signature is affixed by the subscriber with the intention of signing is presumed similarly um, unless contrary is proved a secure electronic record has not been tampered is a presumption because it is so full proof this sort of a digital signature that it cannot be generally tampered then we see there are many such other uh, you know clauses or provisions made by the evidence act uh, which are important for example the opinion of the certifying authority with regard to electronic signatures what he testifies and says is true uh, the certificate says speaks about who the person is uh, to whom the certificate has been given it is presumed those things are correct so uh, now this brings us to the it act does it act also have any provisions under the evidence uh for collection of evidence it does it does because blocking of public access for example if a particular site has to be blocked there those powers are given interception powers are given like you have telegraph act we have in the it act also rules for collecting traffic data and information and uh, usually you know with the secretary it uh, approval these can be taken from there you know the details of traffic data likewise uh, this this slide basically shows you know the kind of powers of the central government to intercept data uh, the intermediaries liabilities uh, examiner of electronic evidence power to block any content collection of traffic data power to protect systems or which are critical to india and nodal agency the cert in becomes the nodal agency which has uh, all uh, incident response to be given you know in terms of any incidents which happen in india so these uh, are important authorities and important powers under the it act also for collection of evidence and here the role of eee is very crucial which is the examiner of electronic evidence like proving in say medical negligence cases a doctors who testify or saying you know about the veracity of a particular uh, method used for operation or otherwise you know some facts the examiner of electronic records uh, sorry electronic evidence will testify whether this is actually a correct report or not correct report or what is the credibility which can we can give to this electronic evidence he is the uh, final say on the uh, veracity of that then the eee under the it act also has been uh, you know notified many of these uh, have been designated these are generally forensic science laboratories they are uh, the authorities and the examiners which are you know forensic experts who are under it will actually execute those uh, tasks which have been assigned to them it's important for me to also highlight how in during cyber forensics we actually collect evidence now the goal is obviously to correct collect it in such a manner that it is not tampered in one of the investigations on the hard disk a police officer by mistake kept his mobile phone the magnetic field corrupted the entire data in the hard disk and that's why it's important to understand when a when a evidence comes to us which is electronic forensically it has to be corrected as per the sop as per the standard operating processes which are to be followed it should not be tampered and for that reason uh, normally when we take data from a hard disk and mirror image it to another disk the uh, write blocker is used so that there is no corruption of any kind of data which happens at that point of time when the transfer is taking place the hash value is generated which is like a cryptography which is like an algorithm if i even remove one comma from a data it will change my hash value so the destination drive to which it is copied and the source drive that that hash value has to match so that is what we really you know rely on to see whether this has been tampered or not tampered and that's become very crucial in forensic uh, science so uh, at the time when the certificate is given uh, 
the, the presenting evidence has to be also done in a legally admissible manner. So if her hard disk is a uh, mirror image is uh, put in the you know filing, then the hash value of the source and the hash value of the mirror image should be there on the certificate as well. Likewise, you have disk-based forensics, network-based forensics, mobile forensics, email forensics, and various tools have been used by forensic experts. You may get, uh, you know, existing files, deleted files, data, email, chat logs, uh, internet history, browsing history, uh, any kind of encrypted files, any steganographed hidden files as, as evidence. So that is sometimes, you know, we use recovery softwares to recover data also, uh, you know, forensically. And many of these methods are used even in the FBI handbook, even in the CBI, when we train CBI. Uh, CBI also uses SOPs of such kind where uh, deleted files have been pulled out and that is, you know, uh, used, keyword searching is used. Um, and all this forms part of, uh, you know, digital evidence and that can be brought in the court of law. For email forensics, we look at the headers. The header of an email will have the IP address from which it's been sent, the message ID also, and one can trace the IP. You can trace from where it is originally uh, you know, coming from, which is like a technical header. And that is usually hidden. Unless we go to Gmail, for example, and we look at view full source, we don't get that. So those are important things as well. And in the whois.net, you know, for example, this is a very interesting uh, site where we see uh, if a particular website is, uh, you know, uh, registered, in whose name is it registered, uh, that can be given, uh, you know, found from here. And who is the owner? Sometimes a criminal may create a site and do it in such a manner that he gives all false entries here. But then by contacting the registrar, we are able to get the real uh, address, you know, of the person and their contact details. And in many cases, we have resolved phishing attacks and other uh, rackets through police, you know, uh, uh, basically cooperation police agencies uh, found the right, you know, footprint from where this uh, particular website was created, which is you know, a fraudulent website or from where a particular, uh, you know, email was sent, it can be found out. Interestingly, there are uh, maybe in the evidence you will also find Wayback Machine reports where, uh, you know, through Wayback Machine, you are able to on, on, on the website and go and see, you know, uh, how a particular site looked maybe five years ago or two years ago or two months ago, because uh, many of the criminals use this uh, technique to hide the real identity and remove the real uh, content, which is a fraudulent content like a phishing website after a few days you know, of defrauding people. So this website captures like a web crawler, it captures the screen to screenshots of, from time to time of particular sites. And that has also been very helpful in producing evidence in courts of law. So likewise for fake news, a lot of these uh, tools and websites are being used to, to actually say this particular page is fake or this particular post was fake. And many of these you will be uh, seeing. And in today's times of artificial intelligence, more and more facial recognition, uh, you know, uh, I would say based electronic evidence, artificial intelligence based electronic evidence specifically to do with health records or otherwise may also become important. How a particular data was stolen, um, how it was, uh, you know, a facial recognition, uh, you know, software was used, for example, uh, or a password was cracked. All these are key issues which are becoming an uh, everyday scenario and used as modus operandi uh, by criminals to commit crimes. This site, for example, shows what is my IP. One can actually look up an IP address on Google and just go to the site and find out the IP from where a particular crime has taken place. Regarding IP, I would also want to mention there are two kinds of IPs. One is a static IP and one is a dynamic IP. Now, in, in case of dynamic IP, uh, the, the interme intermediary, for example, if I use Airtel or any other uh, service, the moment I log in and you know, I am connected on the internet, I will have a dynamic IP. And uh, uh, after I log out from that uh, you know, uh, time and I re-log in, I will have a new IP. But there are many companies who use static IP. 
And in one of the cases, interestingly, we used, uh, you know, to check the IP address from where a crime was committed. And we were able to find these uh, anonymous IPs, uh, some anonymous proxy servers being used abroad, from abroad, showing a Mexico address, showing some other address. And uh, one of the addresses happened to be Delhi. So that put us to an alarm that this, if it's showing Delhi, it must be somebody Indian. Uh, and then uh, we checked up uh, it's, it, that the IP was of Delhi and the person had used a proxy server or a hiding software to actually conceal his real IP. And it happened to be a competitor who was trying to damage the uh, work of another, uh, you know, uh, competitor. So he was doing fake ticketing on of airlines. So these are the kind of you know evidences which may be brought uh, from websites or from uh, you know uh, online tools which are available. And many times these footprints are important, you know, to see. I know there's lots to be done on this area when we talk about electronic evidence, but uh, in an hour and a half session, probably it may not be possible uh, to do the entire uh, you know, uh, discussion on this in detail. However, there are uh, some books I have authored, uh, one of them being Computers, Internet, New Technology Laws, uh, which will be I mean, helpful in case you'd like to read this. And uh, there have been other uh, you know, interesting books like Children, Protection of Children on the Internet, or the handbook legal toolkit of child victims of cybercrime. And uh, lately I've also authored a book on artificial intelligence unveiled, which will be uh, brought about in publication in another week's time on Amazon books. And similarly, you have a, a, an app which you can also access IT Act and Cyber Law India, uh, which is a free app uh, for use, uh, which has a lot of cases uh, on electronic evidence and otherwise, uh, which will be helpful aid. With this, I just uh, want to uh, summarize our discussion today. Uh, we saw that the IT Act uh, 2000 was enacted like 20 years ago. The cyber crime has been on the rise, almost uh, doubled every year. And the kinds of crimes which are percolating, uh, whether it's ransomware or it's man in the middle attack or defamation or IP data theft cases, and in those kind of cases, uh, the jurisdiction becomes a key issue because we have to see from where a crime was made, committed, or where the effect of it is felt. Those those jurisdictions important are important apart from where the defendant stays or works for gain, or part of cause of action arising, or where the infringement of copyright is taking place or trademark is taking place. Whether a site is interactive, is a targeting based principle is used to understand whether the uh, site was actually uh, targeting customers in a particular area or not and a target based approach is used to uh, you know understand jurisdiction will lie or not uh, likewise we also saw that um, many cases we have uh, mens rea coupled with actus reus where we using offenses and these are classified under cyber crime whereas some of them may be classified as tort law you know as, as a civil wrong and there uh, the special courts which are there in criminal system, justice system, uh, for criminal cases, there are no separate cyber crime courts yet, but although this is a welcome change if it is brought in India, it will reduce backlog. And uh, though we have special cases and uh, courts uh, for POC, so we don't have uh, one for you know general cyber crimes. Also, India is not a signatory to the cyber crime convention yet. I feel that there is a need for that as well. And that will help transporter cyber crimes to be tackled at more uh, robust manner. And then uh, when we come to uh, civil, you know, kind of wrongs, we have adjudicating authority and uh, we have the TD SAT, which uh, hears its appeals from there, and then High Court and Supreme Court. And in terms of electronic evidence, whenever these issues come in the court of law, whether it's a criminal case or a civil case, all kinds of electronic evidence are important, whether it's an IP address or if it's a website or a screenshot of an email or a, you know, a, a particular chat, all are important. Either one can give primary evidence, which is the main device in, in, involved, or one can give secondary evidence as per section 65A and B of the Indian Evidence Act. And when we use that, we always need a affidavit a certificate under 65B by the chief technology officer or responsible person who's handling that device. And that needs to say that this is an original printout from the same and maintained in the daily course of business. 
and it's the machine was not malfunctioning at that point of time and it's correct uh, correct uh, evidence that we are producing and in that uh, with that compliance things will be uh, you know uh, compliant with the requirements of evidence act as per the uh, uh, the latest and the trial judgment also uh, this is the correct law the anwar versus bashir judgment the requirements of 65b 4 are you know and a and b are uh, kind of settled law by now and only if one person is uh, you know not able to prove it uh, or get that particular certificate he has tried all means can this be waived and generally it's not uh, you know something which one can just uh, leave in terms of admissibility it's something which is mandatory now and under the law and that is essential so with that uh, we have seen the kind of cases and like dharambir's case or we have seen uh, the alprakash case or bali.com case where all kinds of electronic evidence has been used and therefore uh, having said that we also need to see whether the evidence given is uh, what is the weightage to be given to that evidence so with that if it is challenged then whether it's a private lab or a government lab report the veracity of that the testimony of the witness the cross examination all those important aspects are there but the final say on the uh, the whether this evidence is correct or not the examiner of electronic records under section 79a of the it act is very important like an expert witness he, he will you know give depose on that and that's important as well and given this spectrum he also look, we would also see at that point of time whether the correct procedures to collect evidence correct procedures to preserve evidence are there and not only that um, Uh, the analysis is correctly done is the hash value matching from what is the source device disk you know uh, hash value so that it is not tampered with all those things are there and then presumption in law you know which are available in the evidence act those are also key considerations while evaluating digital evidence whether it is digitally signed evidence or not holds a, a great uh, important role as well there and looking at all this holistically we also need to now we are also now faced with a challenge how do we you know file this evidence in the court of law we are at this juncture actually we have traveled a long way uh, in in terms of electronic evidence and how we examine and assess it but the challenge now is how will the courts really handle it how it is going to be filed and how it is going to be checked and then <clears throat> whether it will be a zero tolerance based server kept outside the main court server uh where the hash values are stored and the original devices are given back to the fi filing litigants all those issues are which we are dealing with at this point of time so with this uh, i think it gives you a fair idea of how electronic evidence is uh, you know currently looked into when it comes to the paradigm of it act and it law and i hope the session will uh, at least uh, give you a basic introduction and a overview of uh, what is the current law today and where we are proceeding in terms of uh, you know handling these uh, electronic evidence in the times to come a lot of uh, facial based recognition systems are going to be used a lot of ai is going to be used all that data will also be important and also cases of pdp you know a lot of data protection uh, i would say violations will come into play and we have to be equipped we have to be equipped and our ngo fire which i uh, set up only for trainings uh, has been training a lot of judicial officers uh, whether it's cbi or uh, a lot of these uh, officers across india and i'm glad that this session today has been put by the you know organized by the mp law college aurangabad and uh, in, in association with the district legal services authority aurangabad and the nlsiu and i hope to have many such sessions with you uh, we can I think now start with any questions if you had, and I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Your words have uh, truly enlightened us. After all, the only thing that can stop a bad person with the power of computers and internet is a good person with the power of computers and internet. The answer to why is always good. Uh, now, with your permission, ma'am. I'd uh, like to request Professor Dinesh Bulte, sir, coordinator of the National Webinar Series, to carry out the question and answer session. Yes. Thank you, Meet.
Good afternoon to all. First, there is a question from Dr. Prashant Desai, former assistant professor from NLSI Bangalore. Madam, don't you think there is a requirement of creating awareness among the investigative agencies? Yes. And judicial members regarding collections and appreciation of digital evidences. Absolutely. I 100% I endorse uh, what, what's the suggestion here because, uh, in fact, I want to share that for, for past uh, two decades, I've been also into trainings and uh, at the CBI Academy, then the National Judicial Academy, Bhopal, then the National Police Academy, uh, you know, also, and many other uh, uh, authorities, uh, whether it is BPRND or other authorities, they have been having various trainings from time to time. The challenge with That's police amazing. officers is that they get posted and they may not be serving the same role, you know, so there is need for uh, more structured trainings, more structured and more, uh, more trainings in terms of updating them with the content. Because even as practitioners of law, you, you would uh, appreciate that there is so much happening in this field that we have to be abreast of the law, abreast of the technology. So likewise, all investigators, all lawyers, all uh, judicial officers, judges, they all need to understand this field uh, at par because they are the ones who are going to give justice to people. And they are the ones who will need to appreciate this. So also generation of SOPs are very important. How do we collect evidence? How do we preserve evidence? And how do we produce evidence in the court of law? All these are important things for uh, each of us to understand. And I think uh, very much applies uh, with, uh, with a great force to uh, law enforcement authorities especially. Yes. May we have the second question? Yes, madam. Thank you, madam. Another question is from Dr. Manila from UP. Madam, many of the digital evidences are lost during collection. What should be done to avoid it? Yes, uh, during collection, many of the evidence are, are uh, removed. I know I have myself dealt with cases where, um, uh, for example, uh, once a client came to me and he says that he's been getting extortion calls and messages and uh, somehow the entire record he has deleted. And uh, the, the hard disk was itself, uh, you know, damaged. So one couldn't uh, reproduce it, you know, get, get recover it also at times, even that scenario happens. So, uh, or somebody may delete the entire evidence out. That is a difficult task. Also, many occasions, the evidence has to be given by the service provider. So service provider refuses to give or doesn't give in time or he has overwritten the data. That is also important because they keep overwriting the data. So uh, the as a result, the, the main uh, evidence may not be available. In many cases, IP, uh, IP uh, cases, spoofing pay cases or identity theft cases, uh, where the IP is there in the email header, which is a public IP. But from the public IP, we find out who is the phone company involved, uh, you know, who is providing broadband. And from there, the broadband company has the actual data. So they also keep overwriting the data. They will not store it forever. That is a challenge, and I think uh, that is why, uh, you know, in the uh, Arjun Pandutra case also, the, the observations of the Honorable Supreme Court are that they should be correct SOPs, or uh, even how the, these intermediaries have to, you know, discharge their role, uh, how much time they have to save the data for. All these things have become very crucial, because if we lose and we don't collect evidence, we don't get evidence, then we are not able to get convictions in the matter. So that is very important now. Uh, we frame, we need to frame these laws and put these SOPs in order. Thank you, madam. Madam, another question is there from uh, Adarsha Dabari, sir. Please differentiate between cyber contraventions and computer-related offenses. Please. Uh, cyber contraventions uh, are more like uh, civil wrongs where a person doesn't have a mental intention to commit a crime, but somehow uh, it has caused a loss to his employer, for example. I was giving an example <clears throat> during the presentation that uh, in some scenarios where, for example, the employee has injected a, a pen drive and he's listening to some music and he, by, by inadvertence, uh, by uh, no intention or knowledge, corrupts the data of the employer. In that case, employer can sue him for loss cost to him, even though he has no neither intention nor knowledge to commit a crime. You know, so in such cases, the, the compensation will be payable. 
So, uh, for example, if somebody downloads a data without permission, 43 section 43, uh, you know, will be live, uh, will be uh, applicable, or uh, somebody without permission uh, damages some part of data. So, in those scenarios, 43 is applicable. However, for uh, 66 will apply if there was both intention to commit a crime or knowledge and coupled with the act itself. In those scenarios, it will amount to a crime. Just like we have uh, in normal balance, tort law and uh, criminal law, uh, segregated, similarly we have this in this IT Act. Yes. Thank you very much. Is there another question from uh, Neha Gupta. In social sites, Instagram, WhatsApp, Facebook, is still an option, delete for, eco for everyone. Is that a recovery? Is is that a recovery? Recovery. Yes. Okay. So if if a post has been made and it has been deleted by uh, the particular post uh, person who is posting it, uh, it may temporarily delete it, but it is still on the server of uh, the you know the the service provider. Somewhere the footprint is there, and it can be recovered as a backup. It might be there or otherwise it may not show you uh, you on your on your device but complete erasure may not be there. So uh, in that scenario, if, if a law enforcement authority asks for some data from the service provider, they will be uh, in the obligation to give it. You know, so therefore uh, it is not that the footprint is uh, you know, gone. That doesn't happen unless the company says so, the service provider says so. And if the law enforcement, uh, like the legal laws of the land do not mandate them to keep it for that long, in that scenario, it may not be there, but otherwise they will have the footprint for some time at least. Thank you, Madam. There is another question from uh, Usma, research scholars from local university. Why there is no ban on dark net? Is it really difficult to trace IP address of cyber criminal who commits cyber crime through dark net? Yes, dark web is uh, a place where you have all kinds of illegal activities happening, whether it is uh, even drug peddling or arms trade or um, any kind of uh, even cyber terrorist activities happen on, on the same and a lot of illegal activities. People are generally using Tor and onion rooting, uh, just like an onion has a peel after a peel after a peel. Uh, on the dark web, the, the IP address is spoofed as is changed in such a manner that there will be a, another country's IP address showing and that it will be like a circuitous route. Uh, so there will be multiple IPs. Only the initial IP, uh, you know, that particular proxy server or the, that particular node, which has the first IP change from the original to the uh, new IP will probably have some footprint of the same. Otherwise, in the whole circuit, in the dark web, it is very difficult to even find anybody's real identity it becomes very difficult for law enforcement as well. Thank you, Madam. There is another question from Rishab Kar, research scholar from Rajasthan. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that there must be some updations, updation in IT Act as crime are updated? Yes, uh, as I mentioned, fake news is one of the key issues with the Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, we were looking at, you know, what are the laws which need to be put in place or the policies, uh, for example, keyword searches and filters to be put by the uh, intermediaries to actually understand and block such content, which is fake news, uh, is one of the issues. Uh, use of new technologies uh, like photo DNA hash mechanism is being used to stop duplication of fake news uh, images or videos on online. And uh, similarly, there are other issues like revenge porn, sextortion, uh, issues uh, like obscene language, uh, which is offensive language uh, usage on emails. Um, and apart from that, um, other issues which are emanating in the cyberspace, you know, man in the middle attacks. Uh, therefore, we need more laws, more laws, uh, you know, to, to deal with these issues. And sometimes existing law may apply. For example, in a ransomware case, where uh, you know I had uh, encryption of data has happened, so obviously you, you would probably uh, it, it will be coupled with some hacking, and th those provisions are there. But nevertheless, we still need explicit laws, you know, to deal with many of these new issues which are emerging. 
uh, to protect uh, you know uh, our general general public as well so uh, specifically i saw one of the issues was morphing we don't find uh, you know a lot of the deep fakes are there today a lot of uh, times people morph pictures people morph videos and they look like real videos so there should be a, a express a lot to deal with these they are not there so likewise you know making of uh, you know obscene cartoons making of uh, extreme pornography those are issues which have been dealt with in european societies in us uk we don't have a clear law on that as well in india apart from general provisions and the poxo but do they actually go on to the extent that they will be covered by cartoons and other uh, sketches that's something which is not even debated at this point of time in india so we need definitely new laws uh, to deal with uh, newer cyber crimes in india thank you madam another question is there from the professor kavita sharma how to control the unauthorized use of my data by social media how to control unauthorized use of my data the best That's example social. is uh, you know to protect yourself is to uh, put only that content which you don't mind putting you know you don't want other people to misuse it it is uh, a different story if it is a harmless content you are putting and somebody is morphing it and misusing the same but if you are uh, there are a lot of especially young children today who don't realize uh, they're clicking selfies which are not uh, supposed to be clicked some personal information they're putting on servers or other other places they're exchanging and then later on falling into a problem uh, of uh, you know revenge pornography or otherwise so uh, it is important to educate educate them on the safe use uh, and practices uh, and generally people every everybody you know they like to post where they are going for example they will like to post on facebook or otherwise that they are going on a holiday and then the house could be burgled uh, you know behind by somebody who has got unauthorizedly this information so one has to be cautious of what one posts online that is the bottom line and uh, unless we adopt uh, our own safety measures Uh, we will not be putting our risks uh, in a you know minimized manner in, on the net another question is there uh, i will take the only two questions sure one question is from usma masood again she research scholar from local university as the number of iot devices are increasing and generating huge amount of big data whether personal or non personal how is the indian cyber legal framework especially the personal data protection bill 2018 address the concern on unauthorized access and use of non personal data yes unauthorized use of uh, non personal data is another issue which is emerged apart from the pdp bill which is talking about the personal uh, data which is being protected by whether it's sensitive or otherwise non personal data could be uh, you know uh, for example it could be an I- ip related uh, asset it could be a database which is very uh, important to a company and non that may be non personal but is valuable right for any organization so how do we protect that uh, at the moment we have these provisions like 4343a in the it act which protected to some extent but definitely there's a huge gap and we need a new law on non personal data protection as well and i think the indian government is already working on this as well so uh, there is work uh, in, you know in progress in this regard as well apart from the personal data protection and both are very valuable so it while personal data protection uh, is important because it will cause uh, harassment or maybe you know harm personal harm to a person, individual it could also uh, you know non personal data could cause a lot of harm to corporations or even uh, government entities for that matter it could be uh, siphoned away it could be misused in any manner so both are important i would say and both need equally clear laws and express laws to safeguard thank you ma'am is another question is there is the present it act sufficient to tackle cyber crime against women if you yeah. ask me uh, every day i don't know how many queries we get uh, of women being harassed online whether it is trolled or uh, you know sexual harassment or any kind of uh, trolling or any kind of uh, intimidation and uh, the 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 whole framework of law is such that uh, although we have provisions in the act uh, in the ipc as well 354 a b c d i was mentioning it act 67 67 a 66 e protecting their uh, you know against invasion of privacy 
yet yet we don't find the improvement is so uh, robust the problem lies in uh, first of all not reporting the, there is a fear of reporting so people are not reporting it and women are not coming up uh, to report these crimes and also apart from that the investigating authorities and the courts you know they need special courts for uh, at least uh, redressal of women rights and uh, you know child related offenses and it needs to have a rigorous you know faster in expeditious investigation into these crimes and a lot of times women are using twitter as a mode to actually give their redress you know ask for their redress uh, there are organizations like ncw uh, which offer support and there are various ngos with support however uh, enforcement is a challenge and i think the the laws are there however we don't have effective enforcement in india which is the need of the hour Uh, do we have another question, uh, Professor Kalte? Is there another question, Professor Kalte? Yeah, ma <clears throat> madam, there is one question from uh, that is regarding to is there any uh, from uh, Pratiba? Mm -hmm. Is there any training program going on for lawyers for presenting it at, at cases regarding from your institute from your uh, Yes, uh, from time to time uh, we have been uh, training, conducting various trainings and by now probably more than five lakh of, uh, you know, I would say, uh, different law enforcement uh, body officers have been trained, uh, both Indian and abroad also. We've trained Palestinian uh, officers also at CBI Academy. And under our organization FIRE, we had uh, during COVID, COVID times also almost 50, 60 sessions, uh, different webinars and workshops. But the current, uh, there was also a course of three days, you know, we were doing uh, for training the lawyers and, uh, you know, anybody who's interested in this area. And we hope to do uh, some online sessions very soon. Uh, in case you would like, anybody would like to join, uh, please send us an email. Um, and uh, my mail ID uh, is at the end of the presentation. Plus, I think Professor Kolte can actually circulate this PPT if need be. And uh, also, uh, it will have my email ID at the end of the PPT. So anybody uh, who's interested may write to us. We will ho uh, we will have a workshop planned uh, to deal with specific issues on cyber uh, as per the interest levels that can be worked out. Thank you, madam. I hope uh, cool. there is one la last question, madam, and then we'll stop. Very well. Very well. Uh, from Rishabh Garg again from uh, Rajasthan. As in your presentation, you told about cyber threats like ransomware. How can we identify that is a ransomware threat? Okay, so uh, when we download anything from the net, we need to have, uh, you know, very, uh, I would say, soundproof or uh, foolproof technological aids. Like you have an anti-spyware, anti, -spyware, anti uh, uh, you know, like key loggers can be detected with anti-spyware as well and uh, you need to have antiviruses. And if it's uh, Apple, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to detect. They have very strong, uh, I would say, uh, technological support there. And even for Windows uh, systems, there is a strong uh, technological support through its center, which quarantines any kind of uh, viruses which come to your email box or uh, on your device through any means. So you are able to actually identify and, you know, through, through those software and tools. It's important to use that before downloading any file from the net. They should be scanned, scanned for viruses. That is the best way that you can safeguard yourselves. Thank you. I hope uh, question and answer session is over. We'll proceed further. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. I once again request uh, coordinator, Professor Dinesh Kolte, sir, to kindly propose a vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Meher. Good afternoon to one and all present here. John Kennedy rightly said, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Honorable Dr. Karnika said, today's resource person, respected participants, 
I am it a great honor and a privilege to propose note of thanks on this second day of webinar. Today, we have witnessed a wonderful session on appreciation of the digital evidence of eminent speaker, internationally acclaimed speaker, Dr. Kanika Setman. I want to express my heartfelt thanks to Madam for gracing this occasion and giving a valuable insight on this thing. Thank you so much, Madam. This has been a very fruitful and innovating session. Thank you, Madam. Again. My pleasure. Thank you. I express my, I extend my sincere thanks to our Vice Principal, Professor Sri Krishan Mori, sir, for delivering welcome, welcome address. Also, mention my special thanks to Sri S.D. Indrakar, Judge and Secretary, District Legal Services Authority, Aurangabad. I also express my sincere thanks to Dr. Sadhna Pandey, Madam, Head of Department, PG Studies of Law of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar University for her continuous support and continuous participation in this uh, program. At the same time, I, exp I ex also express my thanks to our principal sir, Dr. C.M. Rao sir, who always support us to organize such a program. And my helpful thanks to go to all the participants, judges, educators, teachers throughout India, students and officers, though they are working in a different departments of the state of Maharashtra on the uh, various departments, uh, I will specially mention the name of the Shri Rajendra Kale sir, who are with us since the last two days. I also express my thanks to all the participants and others who have, assist, who have assisted us to organize this program. I have once again thanks to all of them and I apologize uh, today's uh, speaker if we have committed any mistake, please apologize. Some uh, troubles were there. At the same time, three programs are going in the college. Thank you, Madam. My pleasure. I thank, uh, I think the organizers, uh, the MP Law College, Aurangabad, and the District Legal Services Authority and the NSIU uh, for organizing this uh, wonderful interaction. It has been my pleasure and thank you for uh, uh, listening to the session patiently. I know it's a subject which is uh, quite dynamic and in the limited time span we covered quite a bit. Uh, but I hope this has been useful and I hope to uh, have many more sessions with MP Law College and, uh, you know, uh, in this regard. Thank you so much. In, 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 in future, we will have the uh, program of Honorable Dr. Karnika St. Madams in collaborations with the special program will be there. I'm informing the participants. Yes, we can, we can do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, just a small announcement for all the attendees. Uh, tomorrow, we will be having a session on collection of electronic evidence during investigation by Dr. Harold D. Costa, sir, at 11 a.m. So I request all the attendees to kindly join us tomorrow as well. With the permission of the organizers, uh, I'd now like to formally conclude today's session. Thank you all. Thank you, Mir. I also thanks to Mir. I forget to mention the name of him. Thank you, Mir. Thank you, sir.